No other ruins anywhere on our planet is surrounded with more controversy than that of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, or indeed its accompanying plateau. There are many factors to consider when it comes to Egyptology. Within academic fields, there are many no-go areas of study. Although hard work and research within permitted areas has taught us a great deal about the previous 4,000 years of the site's inhabitants, yet regardless of the most astute academic thesis, there remains three, proverbially, large elephants in the room. When it comes to a full or even a mere fraction of an explanation in regards to the origin, of these seemingly impossibly huge pyramids remains patiently absent. No accounts, illustrations of any kind from the era exists. It is simply illogical, especially when one considers the sheer feat these structures must have been. We have presented many previous features, polygonal masonry being present on the pyramids. Eroded, yet younger casing stones protecting inner megaliths, clearly of a tremendous age. Salt sediment found encrusting the lower chambers, and so on, suggesting not only that the pyramids are much older than currently claimed, but were pre-flood ruins. Thus, questions arise. Just how old are the Great Pyramids? In addition to our study of the pyramids, we have also, in the past, asserted that the Sphinx was originally a lion which, interestingly, correlates to the following hypothesis with fascinating accuracy. The Orion Theory The coincidence with pyramids aligned with Orion's belt and other significant constellational positions. Bavall and Hancock support the theory, believing the Great Sphinx was begun in 10,500 BC, creating reference to the constellation of Leo and the orientation of the entire complex with the Nile River and even Milky Way, claimed by them as connected respectively. Zeptepi, using similar methodology, put the age at over 13,000 years. These are clearly astonishing proposals, but the current paradigm for their chronology, we feel, is far too short a time span, and due to our own research, which has uncovered evidence indicative of pre-flood origins, copper tools for such an accomplishment a mere insult to intelligence. Yet, thankfully, due to these various takes on events, their age remains highly contested, and, to us, a mystery which is incredibly compelling. There are many theories attempting to explain the origins of the Great Sphinx, and indeed its original purpose. We have, in the past, covered the compelling theories regarding an ancient celestial alignment to the Great Sphinx. Most popular among these alternative theories concerning the star constellation Leo. However, this theory is not only based upon events which happened over two precessions ago, but is also reliant upon the Great Sphinx actually once being that of an enormous lion. And although lions are mentioned in countless religious texts, ancient and also modern, with these beasts attributed to good deeds or evil, there actually exists another, and we feel more compelling theory regarding the Sphinx's true identity, purpose, and indeed its age. Since its rediscovery among the sands of Egypt, the Sphinx has been attributed to that of a guardian, long said to have protected the dead, and interestingly, this explanation may turn out to have been spot on. The Sphinx, although now possessing a human head, its form is noticeably out of proportion. If one indeed perceives it as a past guardian of the dead, and the underworld in which they dwell, then the Sphinx would have been in fact a dog, or more specifically, Anubis. Additionally, if the Sphinx did once indeed face a star in our night skies, then logically, there would only be one of two stars in which the dog would face both held in high regard for untold millennia, one of which, of course, being Sirius, the other known as the little dog star Procyon. Interestingly, the star Sirius is held in high regard by many ancient cultures, some which insist that we were once visited by gods, locating from this particular star constellation. And with ancient Egyptian art drenched in mysterious beings, 
all attributed as gods who came from the heavens, it could be postulated that the Sphinx was guarding the entrance to what they perceived as the underworld or the realm in which the gods came from. What supports this theory and the possible concealment of this knowledge is the apparent destruction, and now absence, of any identifiable dog-like sphinxes left anywhere on Earth. Anthony West once brought the water controversy theory into the public domain, a theory he has done extremely well from. This evidence has long been used as a form of evidence that the sphinx is much older than currently claimed, and due to the absence of this erosion on the Great Pyramids, also used it to claim it is much older. Additionally, he has also been a verbal advocate for the belief that the Sphinx was a lion. Worrying, however, regarding his motives, if this were indeed the case, then any compelling connections with the function of the Sphinx, the entrance beneath, and the pyramids, each made to specific sizes in relation to the distance of Orion's stars, would be merely impossible to make. However, and what is most concerning, is that with a little research of ancient texts, it soon becomes apparent that the Sphinx was once surrounded by a body of water, conveniently named the Lake of the Jackal, or Anubis Lake. This aptly named body of water has seemingly been covered up, not only by West, but to attempt to conceal the Sphinx's real age, but also its true identity. This fragment of information not only discredits West's profitable rainfall theory, but also virtually confirms the Sphinx's past identity, and with Anubis being named elsewhere as the guardian of the underworld, it becomes apparent that we are on the brink of an explanation for its original purpose. No matter how astonishing. Giza is a literal treasure trove once lost to antiquity. Due to the sheer enormity of the Great Pyramid and its two slightly smaller neighbors, it's undoubtedly the greatest ancient wonder anywhere on Earth. A smorgasbord of mysteries drenches the plateau and beyond. Throughout Egypt, incredibly intricate, accurately carved, enormous stone megaliths and surviving temples can be found. The Great Pyramid of Cheops, which contains the claimed sarcophagus of Khufu, which would not have fitted into the structure, this regardless of how they created such enormous yet astoundingly plumb structures, set over such a large area of space and indeed with the weight of the stones used. The global alignments to these monuments also match the known speed of light. The depth of the mysteries of ancient Egypt we have only but scratched the surface of. We do not know how the pyramids were built and we are no closer to an explanation which is logical for why they were constructed, regardless of the illogical rubbish taught today, than when rediscovered. One said mystery is yet another curiosity surrounding water, the other namely the water controversy of the erosion of the Sphinx. The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly showed that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered, long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock proposed that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC, a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. We fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. It pertains to a dusting of curious drainage systems found built into, or rather just below, original temple structures. The peculiar thing regarding the enigmatic flow chambers is not only their tiny size, 
as if harvesting rather than to be used for ancient drainage of precipitation. However, if indeed proven for the removal of rainwater, it would defend additional alternative historical theories regarding the posit of how the Sphinx lost its nose to rain. This pushes its date of construction, however, into an era not acceptable within modern paradigm. What were these curious channels? What were they constructed for? The channels focused upon in this video can be found protruding from beneath the north side of the Sphinx Temple. These enigmatic channels have been studied and examined by a number of Egyptologists and enthusiasts alike. The diagrams created, showing inner designs of these mysterious features, have shed no light on their original purpose, as if one did indeed simply perceive them as drainage systems. They are practically far too small in diameter. Additionally, this channel in particular actually angles inwards toward the temple itself, as if the creators were instead feeding fluid into the temple itself. The mystery remains unsolved, yet regardless, we find these anomalous channels highly compelling. In our last video, we explored the astonishing discovery recently made upon the Giza Plateau. Hidden in plain sight, another great sphinx. However, this doppelganger of the better-known, long-claimed sole guardian of the Great Pyramids seemingly possesses a greater level of undiluted erosion, indicative of both sculptures' tremendous age. The questions are, however, just how great is their age? How long have the Sphinx, or indeed the Great Pyramids, been here on our planet? Furthermore, the tremendous levels of erosion seen on the pyramids themselves not only do the pyramids display a level of erosion indicative of a prehistoric timeline, but they have seen many additional efforts by a number of now lost civilizations, each far more capable in regards to stonework than the modern man, created a number of layers of far less eroded casing stones, each displaying a varying age, this evidence indicative of several attempts at conservation. These factors all but support the following posit, made by a number of researchers, all claiming that the Sphinx, and indeed we feel, the pyramids themselves, are in actuality as much as 800,000 years old. The most recent studies were surprisingly presented at the International Conference of Geoarchaeology and Archaeomineralogy held in Sofia. Titled Geological Aspect of the Problem of Dating the Great Egyptian Sphinx Construction, the authors of this paper, mainstream scientist Monica Vacheslav from the Institute of Environmental Geochemistry of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and Alexander G. Parkamenko, Institute of Geography of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, have blown the whistle regarding what we have supported for a number of years. The starting point of these two experts is the paradigm shift, which has been initiated within the, quote, debate, which has been intended to overcome the orthodoxy within Egyptology, referring to the possible remote origins of the Egyptian civilization, and, on the other, physical evidence of water erosion present at the monuments of the Giza Plateau which, although suspiciously mainstream researchers such as West and Scotch have made over the years, specifically titles the water erosion controversy, which deliberately overlooked that the Sphinx, having once been recorded as having been surrounded by a body of water, namely Anubis Lake, meaning that the enclosure was once designed with the intent of holding water, itself in turn concealing the Sphinx's possible true identity. Instead, focuses on the erosion clearly made by rainfall and ancient water levels, features we indeed claim were later additions. According to Manichev and Parkomenko, quote, The problem of dating the Great Pyramid Sphinx construction is still valid despite the long-term history of its research. Geological approaches and other scientific methods permits us to answer the question about the relative age of the Sphinx. The conducted visual investigation of the Sphinx allowed the conclusion regarding the important role of water from large bodies which partially flooded the monument, 
with the formation of wave-cut hollows on its vertical walls. The morphology of these formations has an analogy with similar such hollows, formed by the sea in the coastal zones. Genetic resemblance of the compared erosion forms and the geological structure and petrographic composition of sedimentary rock complexes leads to the conclusion of the existence of long-lived freshwater lakes within various periods of the lower Pleistocene era. These lakes were distributed in the territories adjacent to the Nile. The absolute mark of the upper large erosion hollow of the Sphinx corresponds to the level of water surface which took place in this early Pleistocene age." End quote. A link to the research can be found in the script. It is a vindicating exposure of ours and others' work, one which we find highly compelling. What's behind the Sphinx's ear? Hidden in plain sight for many a millennia, there is clearly a blocking stone still in place. A blocking stone we would never have noticed if it weren't for a rather unusual source of information. Recently, we covered the amazing story of Kipri Yanovich Boriska, the extraordinarily intelligent boy from Russia that, from a young age, has supposedly been able to remember a past life a life as a pilot upon the once flourishing planet Mars, destroyed during a catastrophic war. What is extraordinary regarding this claim, however, is the remarkable information that Boriska has somehow been able to share from a very young age, information which has taken astronomers many years to realize. According to Boriska, life on Earth will change irrevocably when the Great Sphinx is unlocked using a mysterious mechanism behind one of its ears. Unfortunately, he has not given any further details about what exactly the opening of the Sphinx will do, though this was enough for us to notice the anomaly resting upon this very ancient monument. Boriska has unfortunately since disappeared. However, while in the public eye, he claimed that he was a reincarnated soldier placed here upon Earth to avert the same destructive fate as Mars, claiming that many of his kind exist upon the Earth, calling them indigo children, often stating all of this while in a trance. Which is highly compelling, as he is not the only one who once prophesied very similar astonishing developments that would, one day, arise surrounding the Great Sphinx. Edgar Case, an American Christian mystic, would often answer questions on subjects such as healing, reincarnation, wars, Atlantis, and future events also while in a trance. Was Case also an indigo child? Graham Hancock is another figure who has publicly claimed that there are many mysteries still left to be unraveled surrounding the Sphinx, specifically that a time capsule is hidden within the Sphinx, a capsule that we will only discover as a species once we are intellectually capable of absorbing its message. When it was shared within the mainstream media recently that an enormous cavity had indeed been quietly discovered within the Great Pyramid of Khufu. The largest of the Great Pyramids, the only one with tunnels constructed within its inside, and additionally, the only one which is, in fact, eight-sided. The reaction by the Egyptian Antiquities Authorities was very revealing of their attitude towards secrets being revealed to the public. Not only were the claims made from reliable sources, but they are also backed up by extensive research projects and, indeed, its resulting evidential data. However, this has not deterred Professor Zawi Hawass from publicly denying any such cavity's very existence, shrugging off all claims and accompanying research as, quote, lies and hearsay with such enormous hurdles in place, prepared to stifle any such discoveries from going public, it is inevitably going to be an uphill battle to expose the truth regarding the Great Sphinx of Giza. How can one still claim the pyramids to have been tombs when they are aware of the astounding burial chambers found within the Valley of the Kings? With the tomb of the sons of Ramses II being not only the largest, but what many archaeologists believe, second to the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx, 
is the next greatest discovery ever made within ancient Egypt. A literal labyrinth of chambers, it was initially discovered in 1825, yet due to its gargantuan scale, it wasn't until 1995, and thanks to an Egyptologist known as Kent R. Weeks, that we have begun to re-establish its true possible size. The tomb was examined several times, even being investigated by Howard Carter himself. Yet due to the outer tombs having been looted in antiquity, he simply used them as a dumping ground for rubble. It was not until 1995, during the Theban mapping project, when Weeks decided to clear the outer tombs. Approximately 70 rooms, lined along long corridors, running far back into the hillside were found. The number of rooms were then said to correspond to the number of sons the pharaoh sired. However, further excavations have revealed that the tomb is even larger, the size of an underground town cut directly from a granite hillside, its true scale still unknown. As of 2006, at least 130 chambers have so far been discovered, yet work continues on clearing the rest of this underground maze. We feel that although a later civilization, one lacking the knowledge to build such monuments, came along and claimed these relics as their own, with the possible motivation of an illusion of power, like that of the many other sites we cover worldwide, predictably, now also conveniently tied to these groups in academia. Yet the true feat these chambers would have been, along with the riches these pharaohs often left behind, are not only proof that these creations and collections of wealth were not only far beyond the ability of copper-wielding academically claimed builders, but that the archaeological evidence does indeed support the theory that these kings either ruled during the creator's civilization or built these monuments themselves. Yet how remains an infuriating enigma. We also feel their age, and indeed original lineage, in the true history of the Giza Plateau is what ultimately becomes convoluted. Yet I digress. Who built KV-5? It is a place we find highly compelling. Tutankhamun is not only the most famous of all the pharaohs, but he is unquestionably the character most wrapped in mystery. Although many are attracted to the legends of the unexplained curse or flock to the Cairo Museum to peer upon his wondrous relics, what many are unaware of is a rather incredible theory pertaining to an as-yet-undiscovered vault hidden in plain sight within his own purported ancient tomb. Known as the Second Chamber Theory, it was initially put forward by British Egyptologist Nicholas Reeves. He argued that it was the secret burial chamber of Nefertiti, who was originally the wife of Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten. Legends say that she was one of the most beautiful women in history. Reeves argues that, due to King Tut dying suddenly, he was hastily buried in the outer chamber of Nefertiti's tomb, with the opening to her chamber then concealed somewhere within the tomb many millennia ago. Again, a tomb unlooted, filled to the rafters with priceless golden relics. Reeves even claims that he himself detected a hidden passageway behind a funerary painting on one of the walls of the tomb. Thus, in 2016, an American survey team harnessing ground-penetrating radar peered into and beyond the walls within the tomb. However, they were unable to confirm nor reject the second chamber theory. Yet this did not dissuade anyone who had become convinced of the theory, coming to this conclusion via different avenues of study, continuing to be convinced of the theory's validity. So, after another unsuccessful attempt, a third was arranged by a new Minister of Antiquities set at a media conference, stating he would conduct a third GPR analysis to, quote, put an end to the debate. The third survey, led by Francesco Porcelli, of the Polytechnic University of Turin, subsequently came forward to publicly state, beyond doubt, that there was no hidden chambers within the tomb. However, this entire sequence of events can simply be perceived as a rather hazy attempt to put people off from covering this story, diverting attention away from its possible truth. Firstly, 
Why three attempts to confirm that a chamber did not exist? For why would the first two attempts have openly admitted that they were not able to confirm such claims without doubt? How could a person from such an institution, if not funded to come to such a definitive conclusion, make such a post-statement? And why would so many from different academic backgrounds arrive at the same conclusion? Is there a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb? And if so, why is it being hidden? What could be inside it? We find the possibilities incredibly intriguing.